Okay, well, good morning, everyone, and welcome post-tornado to the United States Institute of Peace, um, which, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, um, is an independent, nonpartisan, publicly funded institution dedicated to preventing, managing, and mitigating violent conflict around the world. My name is Maria Steffen, and I'm a senior policy fellow here at the Institute. And I think the most critical thing I'm supposed to say here at the outset is that the Twitter hashtag for today's event is civil resistance, all one word. So feel free to tweet away um, as we continue the conversation. On this topic of civil resistance and nonviolent movements, um, our FOSI here at USIP uh, include applied research and publications, education and training, and active engagement with the policy and practitioner communities. And I'm really excited about today's event, which is all about linkages. Linkages between civil resistance, which is a way for people to mobilize and challenge various injustices and inequities without the threat or use of violence, and different but complementary nonviolent tools like negotiations, dialogue, and strategic communications, and about the critical role that the media play in influencing popular perceptions about resistance. It's not always evident how people power, which is a form of nonviolent action relying on extra institutional tactics like silent marches, consumer boycotts, stayaways, sit-ins, street theater, and the building of parallel institutions, tactics we've seen manifested most recently in places like Uganda, Russia, Guatemala, Brazil, and elsewhere. We're not sure how these can always jive with traditional peace building processes like dialogue, mediation, and negotiation that aim to de-escalate conflicts. But as we discussed here at USIP uh, during an event last year that was moderated by our president, Nancy Lindborg, um, it's hard to advance a just peace in many parts of the world without bringing together uh, these different but complementary nonviolent skill sets in strategic ways. I'm especially pleased to welcome those who are taking part in today's event from around the world. So these are individuals who are currently participating in USIP's global campus um, and are taking our online course on civil resistance and the dynamics of nonviolent movements. And they're from literally um, dozens of different countries around the world. Uh, my great colleague and co-instructor of that course, Darren Cambridge, who's seated here in the front and is known to many of you, will be feeding their questions and comments into our conversation today. Another reason why this is such a fun event, at least for me, is that my fellow panelists and I are all uh, alumni of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. The Fletcher School is the oldest uh, graduate school of international affairs in the country and a place that really excels in addressing global challenges through a multidisciplinary lens. I'm proud to say that the Fletcher School has become a mini hotbed of sorts for the study of civil resistance as a powerful alternative to violence. And there are actually a good number of master's students and PhDs who are currently churning out theses and dissertations uh, on the topic of civil resistance, to include a few of us in, on this panel. And I'd especially like to thank Jennifer Burkett-Picker, who is the director of Fletcher's PhD program for helping to organize today's event. And I'm sure if anyone has questions about the Fletcher PhD program, she would be happy to answer them. So we have a great lineup of speakers this morning um, who will be animating the topic of civil resistance from various perspectives. Uh, you have their bios uh, in the programs. And to kickstart the conversation will be Anthony Juanis St. John. Uh, Anthony is a dear friend and senior advisor of the Institute, uh, who is also an associate professor uh, and director of the International Peace and Conflict Resolution Program at American University. 
Anthony will be sharing findings from his um, early research on the role of negotiations in nonviolent resistance movements, um, which I should note will eventually culminate in a USIP special report, so stay tuned for that. Um, next will be Ben uh, Neymar Graus, who is currently writing his Fletcher PhD, or in the process of contemplating his Fletcher PhD <laughs> dissertation. Um, and Ben will be discussing the effects of violent and nonviolent resistance in the South African anti apartheid movement, along with the importance of strategic uh, communications between the leaders of the anti apartheid movement and the leaders of South Africa's National Party. Uh, Josh Yeager, who is an Emmy Award winning network news producer, will talk about a training video that he co-produced for activists called Pressing Your Case, which offers tips on how to more effectively use the media as part of an overall nonviolent strategy. And hopefully Josh will answer that perennial question of whether it has to bleed in order to lead. Finally, we have Liz McClintock, a newly minted Fletcher PhD, so congratulations to Liz, um, who is the founder and managing partner of um, Conflict Management Partners and an expert in designing and implementing negotiation, conflict resolution, and leadership training programs uh, for public and private sector organizations. And I should note that Liz literally just got off the plane from Burundi, where she was um, out in the field working with government and civil society actors. Liz will serve as the discussant for today's panel, um, which means she will orchestrate a beautiful and compelling synthesis of the presentations and tease out some of the interesting and hopefully controversial points that our panelists are going to raise. So we've asked each speaker to talk for no longer than eight minutes, and I know they will be incredibly disciplined with that. And then Liz will offer some short discussant remarks uh, before we open it up to the USIP and global audiences. So with that, thank you all for coming, and I turn it over to Anthony. Can I uh, move this one? Don't do that one. All right. Is this is this podium? Maybe just. Out? You're just gonna close it. Okay. We'll we'll figure it out. All right. Sorry. Good morning, everybody. Uh, at the outset, I should say that the research I'm doing on negotiating civil resistance is something that I'm engaged in with Noah Rosen, who's here in the audience, who is a PhD student at American University, so, so this paper is really me presenting our <clears throat> tentative joint findings rather than just my own. Thank you, Noah. Um, let me start with a, a small anecdote and then proceed to offer some, some thoughts on the connections between negotiation and civil resistance. Um, in the first graduate class I took on negotiation decades ago, uh, I remember vividly an instructor putting up a big PowerPoint slide that said, and it was one of those 20 by 30 feet screens, that one of the obstacles to negotiated resolution of conflict was justice seeking and justice seekers. And having come from uh, a somewhat activist background in my youth, I found that jarring that my own move to conflict resolution uh, was seen by well-regarded scholars as contradictory. Um, years later, um, I was offering a negotiation training to a group of housing activists um, in one of the big northeastern cities of the United States, where there are a lot of homeless problems. These advocates spent the first four hours of the workshop extremely unhappy with discussing negotiation. And at some point I just asked them, what's going on? Why do you <clears throat> don't why don't you want to engage in this topic? What's wrong with the topic for you? <clears throat> and they told me, um, after a sort of uncomfortable sounds, we don't negotiate. 
we take down targets. And the mayor of the city and the city council, those are our targets. And I, I took that at face value, but then I said, what if you got the opportunity to make housing policy or to influence it in a way that was something other than direct action, if you were part of the conversation? And uh, they, they liked that idea, but they said, we're not part of the conversation. We, we just try to chain ourselves to the door of the city council rather than think about what to do if we get in to those meetings. So we want to make the institutions uncomfortable um, with the status quo, but they were intrigued by the idea of being part of the conversation in a more substantive policy changing way. And it, it, it uh, sort of embodied what uh, Veronique Dudouet has called the, the tension between the revolutionary and the resolutionary uh, wings of this bird. Uh, they belong to the same bird, to paraphrase some of our political pundits these days. Uh, and it, it helped me to understand that there are some real but also some imagined dichotomies between the way we think about negotiation and conflict resolution on one hand and nonviolent social and political change on the other. Not content with that dichotomy, I've been uh, looking for several years at some of the ways in which there are important synergies between the two. And some of them, when you talk to anybody who knows anything about politics, are just kind of obvious. But I wanted to get beyond the obvious a little bit and start digging down to, to the not so obvious um, connections between the two. Um, so it's clear to me that, that people power and civil resistance movements, once they take direct action, have a number of uh, important effects. I'm losing my notes here. <clears throat> Certainly they help produce dramatic political shifts. Um, on occasion are remarkably uh, successful in having a regime change, people in power depart, and producing very, very dramatic uh, but real um, political change. But what happens after that moment? What happens in the moment when the Duvaliers depart Haiti? In the moment after the Marcos regime collapses? Is that it? And in my mind, that there, is, there, there are things to explore in that, in that space between the, the cataclysmic symbolic and real change, and then what happens afterwards. And in that gap, we find a great deal of negotiations. But that's not all. I think when we look at civil resistance movements and some of the important historical cases, Noah and I, we see negotiations sort of 360 degrees around the civil resistance dynamic people and organizations. With my housing uh, advocate trainees, uh, there came a point in the workshop when I asked, so what is communication like within your organization? What are relationships like among activists and the leader of the, the group who was, who was in the room with us? Very uncomfortable silence. Until somebody said, well, we, we, we don't really get along very well. There's a lot of rivalry within our organization. There's a lot of miscommunication. And I said, between you and coalition partners out there in the community, people who are your allies in the work you do, well, we get along when we do things together, but there are also important rivalries over resources. There are important uh, and uncomfortable problems in the way that we work together. And they began to see that all of these things are managed by better negotiation. So I, I did finally get them sort of enthused about the topic when they realized that it was, that they had some assumptions about it that sound like this. Negotiation for the committed change agent feels a little bit like surrender. And, and uh, that might be a dramatic connection to make, but it, it sort of sounds like this. And, and there have been many different uh, versions of it. But do we really like to negotiate about rights we feel we're entitled to? Do we like to negotiate and potentially give something up about things that are not really divisible, like our identities, like our need for human security, like our survival needs? <clears throat> 
Do we like to negotiate about redress for grievances? There, there are some reluctances to acknowledge that those things are sometimes not going to be dropped into our laps by the people who need to concede them or authorize them. They are going to be accorded through a drawn out process of bargaining. And, and therefore there is an occasional but possibly uncomfortable realization that negotiations are necessary. Now, when we look at the classic cases of civil resistance, there was no discomfort whatsoever. Martin Luther King, Gandhi, uh, Mandela, whose statue I passed this morning in front of the South African Embassy early, and waved to him, acknowledged, embraced, and understood the power of negotiation to be very, very coupled with civil resistance activities and symbolic actions so that the struggle actions produce the leverage that creates pressure often on elites to pressure leaders not to necessarily make dramatic changes in society but to open the door to discussing the specificities of those changes. Noah and I were looking at King's correspondence from the Birmingham jail and the accord that he reached with the local authorities. That four-point uh, accord had, had, uh, was a moment of triumph for King. And it was a negotiated accord that the protesters were able to create leverage for by boycotting the businesses, by surrounding government institutions, by showing sheer numbers and demonstrating commitment, staying power, and a, an absolute shall we say, reluctance to continue to accept the status quo of discrimination, of structural violence. Once that was done, there had to be specific asks of authorities. And his specific asks don't look a whole lot different today than, uh, they don't look a whole lot different from some of the demands we might see today in civil rights and human rights campaigns. End to discrimination in institutions and end to the visible demonstrations of discrimination. Um, enhanced remedial activity to take people whose rights have been denied to them and make those rights come alive again. In his four points, he accomplished a lot. But then Noah and I realized that this was, for King, an opportunity to create a local precedent for national level demands. Those demands, of course, were going to be part of civil resistance activity at a national level. But again, they would have to be negotiated with, with counterparts on the other side who were going to be governmental authorities. Happily, at the time, the Kennedys were somewhat inclined and supportive of engagement on these matters and wanted them to be negotiated. Strangely, we find some of the most important pieces of literature in the, in the nonviolence, um, shall we say, canon of literature, to be really uh, vocally cynical about negotiation. And, and in this regard, I love to look at Gene Sharp's work, which is so remarkable, but which is so down on negotiation. Negotiation for Gene Sharp is surrender. It is the renunciation of your rights. And yet, when you look at what he really recommends you do with negotiation, he's essentially saying, don't do it badly. Make sure you have civil resistance leverage that is manifest and real and perceived before you get to the table. So although the, the tone of, of some of the, the literature, uh, especially of, of the more um, canonical works of nonviolence, uh, seems to be very negative on negotiation, even those folks are acknowledging that it's an important part of social and political change. Um, and I think that helps us to understand that the resolutionary and the revolutionary are not really dichotomous. They are complementary um, phases. So what we, what we have seen, and I, I think this will be my last remark for timing, uh, is that there are negotiations to create the movement there are negotiations to bring people on board, to get civil society organizations as well as individuals to join it. There are negotiations to get, shall we say, allies who don't want to join it, but to get them to be sympathetic to it and to cooperate with it.
Um, there are negotiations once you get to the table and start demanding the actual substantive political change. And then there are negotiations to implement those changes. There are connections to mediation that, I, that we've looked at and uh, seen that I, I will just mention uh, without uh, delving deep into. And then there is the, the, the strategic third dimension here of scaling up what is negotiated locally and making it what for King and Mandela were essentially national negotiations and what today might also be considered uh, transnational, even global um, desires for some sort of change. I'll conclude my remarks there. I hope I'm on time. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. So welcome and thank you, Maria, and thank you to everyone else here at USIP and the Fletcher School um, who helped to make this discussion possible. Um, today I'm going to share some initial insights from a research project titled Dear Friend, Correspondence Across Enemy Lines. The presentation draws on, amongst other things, research I've undertaken in the UK and, and in South Africa. So when, when we as policymakers or casual observers alike uh, think about nonviolent conflict, the images that first pop into our mind tend to be adversarial ones. Two or more opposing sides engaged in protests, boycotts, sit-ins, and, and the like. This image is of students in, in Soweto facing off with apartheid era police. This is also how scholars tend to study civil resistance. We draw on theories of civil war, and we tend to define civil resistance as a form of asymmetric conflict. And regardless of whether we're thinking about civil resistance as a process of coercing adversaries to give up power or converting adversaries to share power, civil resistance is first and foremost seen as, as that adversarial process. So I want to briefly sort of expand on, on Anthony's presentation. Um, and this image is of the first few lines of a letter that Mahatma Gandhi wrote to Lord Irwin, British Viceroy of India. It's effectively one of the first salvos in the Indian independence movement. And despite being written to Lord Irwin, you may notice that the letter isn't actually addressed to him. Uh, the salutation that Gandhi uses is dear friend. This is actually only one in a series of letters back and forth between Gandhi and, and Lord Irwin. And this letter serves as the, the theoretical inspiration for, for my research. And in this letter, Gandhi goes on to not just say, dear friend, but he lays out his grievances against the British, the goals of independence, from where and with whom he'll start a salt march, as well as steps that the British would need to undertake to avert the, the salt march. So let's think about this kind of communication as a strategic move, as, as Anthony suggested. So first, Gandhi seems to think of Irwin as having a dual identity, right? He's, he's not simply an oppressor or part of the, the structure of oppression. He's also a potential ally. And second, this type of correspondence is, is participatory, right? It's back and forth. And this correspondence occurred from the earliest days of the, of the independence movement. Social psychology literature suggests to us that individuals who feel like they're part of a decision-making process are more likely to accept an outcome that they disagree with or that they dislike. So point being, 
from early on in a civil resistance campaign, conceiving of individuals on the opposing side as being both adversaries and allies or potential allies changes how the participants in the movement, the leaders and, and members communicate with those on the other side. So here are just two ways of thinking about that sort of strategic communication that Gandhi undertook and that happened in the anti-apartheid movement. This is just one way of, of disaggregating it. High-level correspondence that seeks to resolve underlying political differences. Right? So peace talks, talks about talks. And then lower-level communication, which is not necessarily any less strategic, but includes information gathering, say, from police who might be sympathetic, or your cousin, cousin of someone in a movement, um, or exchanging information to build a relationship or even, even potentially build trust. This also includes sharing information to potentially encourage defections. So this being a USIP audience, I'll just highlight a couple key points in the timeline of the anti-apartheid movement. Opposition started as primarily nonviolent. Quite early on in 1961, it switched to mixed, violent, and nonviolent. In the Mandela was imprisoned along with others in 1964. In the late 1980s, secret and private negotiations about negotiations commenced. And then in the early 90s, there were proper peace talks, talks about a transition. 1994, Mandela elected president. So this image is of a reunion between Nelson Mandela and Christo Brand, who was his jailer on Robben Island. Amongst other things, Brand helped Mandela learn Afrikaans, uh, which he then used to communicate on a regular basis, almost daily, based on the, the archival material that I, that I saw, with all manner of officials in the, in the National Party government. Brand, when reflecting on his friendship man with Mandela, he, he wrote that, he says that Mandela wrote of his long walk to freedom, and I'm proud I walked some of that road with him. So Mandela's regular contacts with government officials and ev about everything from gaining access to a lawyer to making statements about current events helped Mandela learn about the other side and build trust and even friendships. In 1982, Mandela was transferred from Robben Island to Polesmore Prison. A few years after the transfer, this is where apartheid officials and Mandela initiated secret, private, high-level conversations about what negotiations to end apartheid might look like, negotiations about negotiations. And if you look closely at the, at the image, you can see that the green and, white, green and yellow sign that welcomes you to Polesmore describes the prison as a place of new beginnings. Um, and indeed, it was. The, the negotiations in Polesmore and elsewhere set a foundation for later talks, including the ones depicted here in Mel's Park in the UK. This is a, an archival photo uh, that, I, that I uncovered of one of the eight Mel's Park meetings between members of the ANC. You may recognize some young faces there uh, and supporters of the apartheid government. These talks started in 1987 and occurred concurrently with talks separate talks with Mandela. These Mel's Park meetings culminated with Mandela being released from prison in 1990. So implicit in how negotiation experts analyze, conduct, and reflect on conflict is a preference for nonviolence and an aversion to the use of violence. But as I mentioned, the anti-apartheid anti -apartheid movement in South Africa used both violent and nonviolent methods. So did the violent resistance to apartheid have any positive impacts? This image depicts two types of commonly used violent devices uh, by anti-apartheid activists. The shaded bars are of devices captured by the authorities. And the black bars, the darker bars, are devices that were successfully detonated or used by, by activists. In every year 
the devices captured are far higher than those detonated. And moreover, the spikes in state-sponsored repression of the activists map exactly onto the spike in violence used by, by the activists. So activist violence uh, led to state, or corresponded with, with state-sponsored repression. Having said that, propaganda, images such as this one, facilitated mobilization of protest. The, the armed actions of the ANC were part and complementary to the struggles being waged largely through unarmed means in townships and mines through, throughout South Africa. And organizations in the struggle, including the United Democratic Front, depicted here, adopted the ANC's iconography and used it to promote both nonviolent and violent mobilization. And so as we think about actions that got Mandela released from prison and that got all South Africans the chance to vote for the first time in a free and fair elections, we can recall some three main points. The first being that violent resistance had countervailing effects. The second, that correspondence occurred, correspondence across enemy lines occurred throughout the anti-apartheid movement from early on through to the end, and that that correspondence occurred concurrently at the same time as nonviolent and violent attempts to exert leverage <laughs> and undermine the pillars of support for the, for the apartheid regime. And the third, that correspondence played a role in facilitating the political transition in South Africa that, that we saw about 20 years ago. Thank you. Okay, if it bleeds, it leads. Thanks. <laughs> now, we're going to talk about why that is. Thanks to Maria and USIP for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, this spring I'm coming up on 20 years in mainstream network news, and I'm required to say at the start that I'm not here on behalf of any particular news organization. I'm here on my own time. <laughs> Uh, but I've been doing what I'm doing for for 20 years, and I've been in some strange situations over that time, thinking back about it. There was the, the time Charles Manson asked me if I wanted to pose for a family Christmas card with him. There was the time I found a suicide bomber application in a Baghdad hotel, and upon investigating further, found that they were no longer accepting applications because the waiting list was too long. Uh, these are examples of, of many situations in my career where I've covered violence. But over the years, I've also found that nonviolent stories have, have in many ways been more interesting to me. It doesn't seem like the media does enough to cover movements of that type. And I know I see heads nodding in agreement. That's, that's, a, that's a recurrent theme. We don't do enough. We don't do it well enough in covering nonviolent movements. And I began to wonder why, and really to start thinking about, about why. And, and it turns out that there are some real answers to that. They tend to be answers that activists in nonviolent movements don't like, at least not uh, at the beginning. But I think looking at them more closely, uh, they can be explained and parsed in such a way that they actually wind up making some sense and they, they also suggest uh, strategies to make the change. In my own case, thinking about this question led me to make a film, uh, which was mentioned, Maria mentioned, called Pressing Your Case. I'm going to show you a very, very short uh, clip from it. But uh, the, the film sets out to answer a number of really basic questions about the media. And it's made for activists and nonviolent movements with no media experience. So it wants to know things like, 
how is the media landscape changing? Obviously, social media have had a huge impact. Uh, and there are both incredible strengths and also some problems with social media, which we encounter in my business. I can talk a little bit more about that later. Um, technology uh, in and of itself has changed things immensely. I used to take six people to a story, no matter where it was on the planet, and now very often I'm going there myself with this. Uh, that, that suggests a number of important changes. How do different types of media organizations function in different types of systems, governmental systems? That's another question that the film asks and answers. And then there are some basic stories. What do journalists look for in a story? And how can members of a nonviolent movement organize things strategically in order to help journalists get what it is they're looking for? So there's one, there's one really uncomfortable truth, at least it's proven to be uncomfortable for nonviolent activists, um, that, that emerges as a, as a conclusion from this film. And it's this. Activists do not have a right to media coverage. It's up to groups to figure out how to get the media engaged and interested in what it is they're doing. And there are lots of ways to do it. So cutting to the end, it doesn't have to be true that if it bleeds, it leads. And I'm hoping we can get into a discussion about that a little later. Um, you have to figure out how to get journalists interested. And that means developing a media strategy in, in, in an organization. And there's components to a media strategy which are extremely important. The message is one of the most obvious ones. Designing a message that effectively represents what your movement stands for, not only what it stands against, what it stands for. Targeting an audience, figuring out how to disseminate, best disseminate your message to that audience. And of course, matching your message and your audience is an extremely important endeavor. If they're mismatched, you often run into problems. In thinking about an audience, it's also important to realize that media may be your first audience. So this is not a small set of questions, how, how activists should deal with media in order to more effectively collaborate with them. Um, so the film, as much as, as activists may disdain journalists, um, or journalists must be, might be a mystery to activists in many cases, the film seeks to, to address how they can work together more effectively. And I'm going to play you just a very, very short excerpt. There's a lot more. And at the end, I can tell you how to watch the whole film if you want. This was made in collaboration with um, a friend and colleague, an academic in the UK, who also worked as a journalist for many years. Cannot perform the requested action. This is what I pretend to know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Should I try again? I'm not sure. Can one of our folks in the booth help us? Yeah, he's good. I could narrate it. Can you try closing it again? No. Uh, it is, yeah, we could go to the, we could do it that way. Let's do it that way. Just going to take a minute. So just a, a part about the person with whom Josh um, created this film. Uh, his name is Howard Barrel. And what's interesting about Har Howard Barrel, um, building on Ben's Hello, earlier. I'd like oh. to introduce you. <laughs> oh, boy. Are you able to? Anyway, so he'll he'll figure it out. Um, 
Howard Barrow, incidentally, was a member of the armed wing of the uh, anti-apartheid struggle. He's a white South African, um, so he was in the bush leading guerrilla warfare for a while, came to the conclusion that it wasn't the most effective form of resistance, um, began to embrace the active nonviolent resistance of the UDC and other groups, and since then has become sort of a leading proponent of strategic nonviolent action. So it's sort of an interesting story that builds on Ben's earlier point. Okay, I think we got it. Okay. Now we got it. Full screen. We do full screen. We also need volume. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start. Yeah. This is where the Muslim community meets. Are you? The question is, is your story close enough to the audience to mean something to them? If not, how can you make it so? As you think about stories, remember what we said earlier. News is now. Taking place in Norway, a bomb in the capital Oslo. It's got to be tied to something that's happening, something that's actually occurring in the moment. We call for help here in Bahrain. We cannot tolerate this. We cannot bear this. The hospital is full of casualties. And you need to get the right person from your movement to put the story across. Get sloppy about choosing your words and you're asking for trouble. So choose them carefully. Unlike these American politicians. We're very honored to be back in San Francisco. We're here for a great convention. We had a great convention. Or San Diego, excuse me, San Diego, sure. Our national interest ought to be to encourage the best, best in the world. It's got to be something to get the word across. That is a conspicuously careful choice. The question is whether we're going to go forward to tomorrow or we're going to go past to the, the, the back. Let's pause here and revisit one of our central points about news stories. You don't have a right to media attention. You have to figure out how to get journalists interested. And if you want to focus on an issue, it helps a lot to give the media a person caught up in that issue to focus on. Among the crowd, a frail-looking 65-year-old woman demonstrates. She and the people near her are hit by tear gas and water cannon. The retired apolitical English teacher has been elevated to near-mythical status on the net. Take an issue you're interested in, then find a person embroiled in it. That's your story. Who killed Neda Abu Sultan and why the sensationalism that went all across the world? She's now become a symbol and master for the protesters. That is the most important, the human touch. Here we're just going to go forward a little bit. This is a discussion of how celebrities can help. What we can do is try to first promise raise money. Let's review the elements in a good story. It will usually deliver a clear, positive message that supports a favorable image. It was a creed written into the founding documents that declared the destiny of the nation. Yes, we can. When possible, it will contain a local angle. A neighborhood business with strong community roots is closing shop and a link to what is already in the news. And always a good central character. It's important to assemble these elements as early as possible so that if a journalist shows interest, you are instantly ready to provide what he or she wants. So that's the kind of information that's contained in the, in the, in the movie, which um, was very generously funded by ICNC, International Center for Nonviolent Conflict, and we spent years putting it together. Um, and got to interview some fascinating people. Uh, so, both from the clip you saw and from the from the larger movie, which I encourage you to see, there are a very there are a small number of exceedingly important points that need to be remembered. Activist groups need carefully planned messaging, timing, and outreach. We talk about all of these things. We talk about how to approach a journalist um, and what constraints there are on that kind of interaction. It's touched on here in the clip. It's critical to remember that stories, though you may have a cause, 
that's incredibly worthwhile. Stories are better thought of as being about people than they are about issues. So a story about an issue turns into a story about a person who's embroiled in an issue. Mm. And if you are looking to get your story into the media, the first thing you, you, you probably want to look for is a, is a dynamic person who somehow personifies the issue. Um, making this movie made me think a lot about my role as a journalist. And it's changed my thinking on that. And I hope that, um, as I say, that you all will watch it and that it will affect, in some sense, those of you who are activists, how you think about your role in working with us. Thanks a lot. Thanks, John. Oh, sorry, should I get a link to the movie? Should I just say how to? Yeah, go ahead. Anyone who's mo interested in seeing the whole movie can um, reach me at likelystorymedia at gmail.com, and I will send you a link. Good morning, almost afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you. I think I'll stay here as the discussant. So thank you to Anthony, Ben, and Josh for kicking us off on what I hope will be a very interesting discussion. I think what I'll do is pull a couple of threads that I heard and that I found interesting. And then there are a number of questions from the online group that have already come in uh, that's watching out there. And I'm going to sort of start us off with one question. And then we'll open it up uh, to everyone else. So as I, I think all of you pulled from this, the three presentations, there are really critical links between all three. Uh, Anthony raised for us this tension and explained nicely the complementarity between what he called um, the resolutionary and revolutionary wings of this same bird. And I think understanding that complementarity is critical to movements around the world. Uh, Maria mentioned that I just came from Burundi, and I think one of the challenges is understanding how a movement such as arose in Burundi last April, why did it peter out? What, what, why wasn't that a success? And, um, you know, resistance in Serbia, uh, nonviolent resistance in Serbia was a success. So I think just as a preview, I, I'm sure that folks will, would love to hear more specific stories. We got a little bit from Ben, but I know that they'd love to hear more about successes and failures because I think managing this tension between uh, a group of a, a large group, cross-ethnic, uh, predominantly young people in Burundi who did rise up uh, in protest, uh, very largely peaceful, yet it failed to gain traction. And and I think how, how can we both understand that situation and then provide advice um, going forward to to similar movements is is critical. And I, I think. What Anthony underscored and I think is important for us all to remember is those kinds of movements can facilitate what we call in the negotiation and conflict resolution field, right, is ripening of a conflict such that it might become um, ready to negotiate. And that is, for me, one of the most valuable roles I see of nonviolent resistance is pushing the ball forward on that. So um, something that Ben mentioned is, I, obvious, I suppose, but uh, sometimes we don't, f I think, appreciate the importance is the role of strategic communication. And it's linked directly to some of the issues that Anthony raised as well, the example of the group of housing activists. Negotiation is all around us, right? We use it all the time. And I don't think we could have a civil resistance movement without some negotiation uh, taking place, uh, whether that's getting the folks on board, getting new people on board, as Anthony mentioned. Yet uh, what Ben underscored is it's it's how that strategic, strategic communication is really how it's managed, how it's framed, and how it's then used to promote your purpose. And, and Josh ni nicely followed on on that as with the role of the media. In Burundi, as in many other conflicts, the way that was thwarted was by shutting down media. So therefore, you didn't have that particular tool. I, I'm imagining that uh, some of the folks uh, who have questions might then wonder, what, what can we do in the absence of media? So it's something to presage some of those questions. But I think 
one thing that, upon reflection, that Josh raised, and now I think about the situation in Murnia in particular, since I was just there, is that this idea that you don't have a right to coverage. It's not just that it, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. It's that, in fact, having a communication strategy, which Ben mentioned, is so critical then to getting our message out there. And again, it seems so obvious, but if I'm sitting in Josh's seat, I I have to be able to appreciate what, what's gonna sell my story, you know, and understanding that it, we don't have this right, um, I think for me makes it a lot, I think I could give better advice now to, to folks in the field. Um, I wanted to start off, um, one one person asked uh, from Sweden. His name is Thomas Nordber, and I, I think hopefully Anthony addressed this somewhat. But it was how may the coupling of negotiation and nonviolent action be conceptualized? And I think we got a good sense of that. So I'd like to link that to a second question um, by uh, a young person named Amanola Huptak, but we don't know from where. And this is addressed. Oh, well, I think to all of you, actually, so whomever would like to go first. But if the media shows armed intervention leading to desired change, do you think such practices give audiences the sense that such a method of struggle works and may, in some cases, discredit or minimize the effect of nonviolence as a theory and method of change? Should we take that? Yeah. Um, that's really a question for you and your book. <laughs> yeah, it is. Although, you know, Josh will have a perspective from a from a media stance, but mm -hmm. you know, the reality is that uh, empirically violent campaigns and violent insurgencies succeed about 25% of the time. So, it's not as if they always fail. They do succeed sometimes. And again, I'm I'm referencing um, data collected as part of a book project called Why Civil Resistance Works, which gathered data on 323 campaigns, violent, nonviolent from 1900 to 2006. And you know the findings that Erica Chenoweth and I came up with is, yes, the, the violent succeeded against incumbent regimes or foreign military occupations 25% of the time. But they um, were outperformed uh, by a two to the one ratio by the nonviolent resistance movements. So historically, we can say with good data that nonviolent resistance has been much more effective than violence. And not only that, in the cases, the 25% for these maximalist campaigns where the violence succeeded, the effects, the societal effects of victory are um, enormous. So there's a very strong positive correlation between both the failure of societies to achieve any resemblance of democracy. Um, so if you care about rights and freedoms, the societies that generally follow armed victories um, tend not to be so respectful of rights and freedoms. And these are societies that often are going back into civil war within five years after the end of the campaign. So just the empirics challenges the notion that you have to have the violence to win. But to bear in mind, even if you do win, think about what's going, going to be happening in your society afterwards. But Josh, I think you're maybe better poised to answer the media part. Yeah. I'm certainly happy to take it on. Um, look, if, if a team of journalists lands in a city where on one street corner there is a, or one neighborhood, there is a series of coordinated terrorist attacks and in another neighborhood, there's a work stoppage. I can tell you which one we're going to go to first. Um, and that's probably not a surprise to any of you. Any of you. But um, when you think about what real news is, I tend to think Maria's book is a story. The fact that nonviolent movements succeed more often than violence does, that's a story, and that's a story a lot of people don't know. What it comes down to, at least in my line of work, is something that can actually be, often be reduced to something pretty simple, and that is that violence tends to be visual. Things blowing up, people fighting, um, and a large current running through stories that succeed in visual media is drama human drama, visual drama, um, are critically important. 
So the question for movements, and this is something I've actually helped movements think about, is how to make nonviolence more visual. And in so doing, make them more, th those events and movements more coverable. And again, it goes to the question of what journalists tend to look for in a story. Do you want to take the, um, the yeah. negotiation part of that? It's, in looking at a number of cases, classic and, and contemporary ones, it seems to, to me and to Noah that um, civil resistance to negotiate function in, in somewhat the following way. Uh, and, and this is hypothetical, it's testable. Uh, there's certainly a coalition building component that has to succeed. That, uh, if, it, if, it is, if it functions, if you get enough of a mass of people who want to participate and say this is the way we have to do something now, uh, their actions, their direct actions, uh, reduce the asymmetry of repression. Typically, government has all the guns. And nonviolent movement eschews uh, or, or foregoes uh, violent responses. Although, of course, there are some mixed cases where there are violent elements in a resistance campaign that are connected or separate from the nonviolent ones. Uh, <clears throat> so there's a leverage creation moment, a reduction of asymmetry. There is a creation of ripeness. Uh, or what Dean Pruitt has called readiness, the psychological change in leaders who now say the costs of the status quo are too high, let's find an honorable exit or the best exit we can from having to maintain this extremely costly status quo. Uh, that's the third part. And then uh, fourth, and this is, I think, neglected by both negotiation scholars and, and the uh, nonviolence literature, is there is always the transformative possibility of engagement with your adversary. Direct engagement with them, when you talk to each other, when you try to persuade each other, when you reason with each other, when you uh, listen to each other and learn from each other, as Ben was discussing, changes happen. People change their minds about decisions they've made, commitments that they've undertaken, and they make new ones, or at least we should say they are capable of making new ones. So for me, those are perhaps four of the many possible connections between the two. So just to, to add to Anthony's point about the power of nonviolent action and rebalancing asymmetries of power, I think that can, have a, can be a double-edged sword. And this came from conversations I had with Egyptian activists in, in the summer of 2011. At that point, Mubarak had fallen. Election, uh, parliamentary elections were upcoming. Many folks, pundits and, and experts, said to the activists and to, to secular uh, members of the secular movement, become a political party, engage in elections, and now you've gotten rid of Mubarak. Now you can win the elections. You can create the Constitution. And many of the activists who were in the streets at that point, summer of 2011, said, why would we do that? They understood their political power. Their only experience, or their primary experience, with having political power was precisely because they were outside of those negotiations, because they were in the streets, because they were in the squares of, of Egypt. And so for them, they didn't have many positive, productive experiences of engaging in uh, institutional politics that they could draw on. Um, whether or not they just needed to, to learn or to read or to see the data to engage, or whether or not they had a visceral reaction. It was a very emotional time in Egypt. There was a lot changing. That, I believe, also played a role. But I think that the idea that just because activists are rebalancing and, and creating leverage on the, on the outside doesn't necessarily mean that they have the skills or the, the inclination to engage in negotiations. So questions from the audience? Please. We just, we just have a mic coming, so just one second. 
And if you wouldn't mind stating your name and your affiliation, that'd be great. So thank you for a really interesting panel. I'm Catherine hughes Freytech. I'm the Associate Director of Field Initiatives at International Center on Nonviolent Conflict. Uh, so I work with this every day and uh, mainly focus on um, groups in the field that are either using or want to learn about nonviolent action and civil resistance um, in a strategic manner. Uh, so first of all, with Josh, I just wanted to acknowledge um, that Pressing the Case has been an incredible film and resource for us and for many around the world, and I actually use it as a core for training uh, that we do for seminars um, for activists and for practitioners. Delighted to, to hear it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think the more people that can use it and learn about it, it's really very effective and very helpful. We've gotten great feedback. Um, my, my comment and kind of question is, starting with Anthony, but I think it probably entails a lot of you, is mentioning the connection, which I think are really important to look at, kind of conflict transformation, including negotiation, and other kinds of, of tactics and strategies with nonviolent conflict. Um, one of the words I haven't heard a lot uh, is the uh, word power. Obviously, we're getting to that with asymmetry and some other things that have been mentioned, as well as people power movements. But for me, that is the key part of all of this and why people need to turn to conflict, whether it's armed conflict or unarmed conflict, uh, to reach a just peace or what I would call an active peace, if you look at Galtung and others. Um, so as long as you don't feel that you have um, enough of a power balance to go into negotiations, as you know, you usually don't come out with a, a strong agreement that can be enforced and that can actually lead to justice, which then creates an act of peace, which then you no longer have conflict possibilities. And so I, I very much hear and think the importance of negotiation as part of um, the tactics and strategy of this nonviolent conflict. But I also wanted to mention, on the other hand, on the other side of a peace agreement or of um, any kind of agreement, what we see in transitional justice states is it's incredibly important to use nonviolent conflict, to use this pressure to um, keep um, the strategy and the, um, the pressure on to keep somewhat of a power balance so that you can actually implement the agreements. And we see so many times that it falls back into conflict or war or struggle when that doesn't, um, when it's not implemented. So I can think of Israel-Palestine, a number of things over the years. Uh, Nepal is another one that we're looking at a lot. Um, so I just want to kind of um, highlight, I think, the importance before. Uh, so nonviolent conflict being used to get toward negotiations and, and also negotiations within those movements, which I think is a really important point, but also on the other side to keep the pressure on to implement agreements to implement things that have been agreed to, because otherwise um, the power that be, uh, the devil's in the details and agreements, and they just won't be implemented, so. Do you comment You know, particularly in a conflict like Israel-Palestine, once the peace process started getting to the point of each side having to take implementation steps that were costly to itself, instead of having popular um, support for those moves, you started seeing discontent, popular discontent for those moves. And so they would go back to secret negotiations, but the implementation parts were always public. And uh, right before Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated, there had finally been a realization uh, on the Israeli side that nothing had been done to prepare the public to support the transition to peace. There had been six decades of demonization and zero decades of rehumanization on both sides. And so their nonviolent movements, their, their grassroots support for peace on both sides has always tended to be uh, somewhat small, um, vibrant, but very small. And these days it's increasingly feeling encircled um, by popular opposition to peace. So your point is well taken. There, there has to be continued pressure for things to actually be done uh, that were written down. I'd also like to add something. Okay. From where I sit, it's, it's um, sort of common knowledge that power often, often depends on attention, getting attention. Um, and that's one of the reasons that social media have been such a such a, a, um, an incredibly powerful tool around the world is that they have decentralized 
the power of information dissemination. Um, now, as a member of mainstream media, I'm, I'm also, I'm also uh, thinking about times where media is actually used as a negotiating tool. People negotiate through the media, and that happens a lot. Um, social media is something we talk about a lot, and, and to go back to it for a second, I think one of the problems we in mainstream media have with social media is, is that there is an accuracy issue. Just because someone tweets something doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> And so I've had That's people. That's not true with this group. Never, <laughs> never. Um, as technolo technology makes things faster and easier, and information flies in all directions at once, um, we still have a verification issue, and um, so there are some built-in challenges as well. Great, thank you, Darren. Do you want to bring some of our online folks in? Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to bring in a couple questions from two of our online participants. One comes in via Twitter from Hamza Agur from Egypt, and I'm going to connect his question with uh, another question that came in through the online forum from Ketket, who's from Myanmar. So um, Hamza Agur's uh, comment is, how can we, nonviolent movements and campaigns, address the elderly groups of the society that do not use social media, only TV. So there's a generational element there to how movements use media. That's the first part of the question. And building off of the use of TV, uh, Ket, Ket provides a little context and says, in, in Myanmar, most of the people accepted the rumors from the media for more than 60 years. When the government wanted to do something, they would share information with the media that were rumors but the government knew that those rumors would trigger a certain response um, from the people. And then the government could then prepare for, a, for that predictable response. And in some cases, the rumors would then become true. So as a result of this practice, this has, that, that has spanned generations, many people in Myanmar lack the skills to identify true information. Uh, her question is, how can, how can and have nonviolent movements developed trust with people regarding the information they put out, and how can they counteract the misinformation put out by governments? And I connected that with the TV, just I'm making an assumption perhaps that oftentimes the, the government's power leverage over media oftentimes is through state-run television. So that's why I made that connection, but I could be. Okay, so there are several points. Yeah. One is that the difference between social media and television is disappearing. Television, watching television as people commonly conceive of watching television is something that's probably not going to be around much longer. Um, it's, it's really about content, generation of content, dissemination of content. And what device you watch that content on is becoming less and less relevant. I did a story years ago about Netflix. And back then, the question everyone in the media industry wanted to know was how are we ever going to get the internet connected to the television set? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and until we do, this DVD model of business that Netflix was using was hugely successful. And the question was, are we going to be put out of business when somebody else learns how to, how to, how to connect the, the internet to the TV? So there's been a, an ongoing concern that each new technology will render the previous one obsolete. Were, were, uh, was radio going to mean that no one read anymore? Is television going to mean that no one watches radio anymore? Um, and is the internet going to mean that no one watches TV anymore? I think that they're fusing. Um, the other point you make is also critical, uh, and that has to do with media systems. When you're in a repressive society, deciding what is true and what isn't often involves looking at the source. And, and it also involves understanding the way different media systems function. How do commercial media function in a free press society versus how state media function in a society where if the president says it's news, it's news. Um, and I would direct anyone who's interested in this to a particular film that I found very interested in, interesting and we used a lot in making this film. It's called Burma Vijay. VJ standing for video journalist, and it's about an, a democratic 
group, uh, activist group in Myanmar during the Saffron Uprising and how they used hidden cameras to document what was going on, smuggled their footage out of the country where it was picked up by mainstream media and beamed back into the country and that sort of gave them instant credibility. So I'd like to just ask a follow-up question on this because I, I think we are seeing it in movements around the world, but it, does access to media and in particular access to social media, is that beginning to create um, sort of like a, a gap between elites who have access to all of these kinds of social media outlets and the rest of the population who in a very poor country may have very little access, not even to television, but maybe only to radio uh, or and, and don't have smartphones, et cetera. So what is the impact on sort of this elitist um, phenomenon that is social media on some of these violent, nonviolent movements and uh, nonviolent resistance? I mean, I would just say, you know, first, sometimes we underestimate the technologies that are out there. So sometimes it's shocking in the most remote places that people are using some smart technology. So that's sort of a first point. But your your larger point is incredibly important about the d digital divide. And what does that mean if you're a strategist um, trying to think through a nonviolent campaign or movement? And frankly, it relates to um, Egypt's question about um, the role of the elderly. Because yes, they're not always going to have access to social media. They don't want to use it. So from a strategic perspective, it's all about, well, how do we reach out to and proactively engage groups that may not use these types of technologies? But oh, by the way, there are hundreds of different tactics involved in nonviolent action and nonviolent resistance that they can participate in. I mean, that's the huge advantage of nonviolent resistance and why it's been so effective. Everyone can participate. Young, old, disabled, able-bodied, rich, poor, there's enough out there that people can do. So as a strategist, yes, there's a role for social media in the initial sort of connections, venting, and especially in repressive societies, gaining voice and gaining confidence in voice that you otherwise wouldn't have. It's also very good at flash, like organizing flash protests. So getting people out for initial street demonstrations, rallies, and the like, but we're social media often falls short and where the sort of door-to-door -door organizing and mobilizing is most important is sort of in the sustainability aspect. So once you move beyond the street protests, that may not involve so many elderly people, by the way. It may involve a lot of young people, energetic folks, but beyond that, sustaining a movement involves reaching out to all deg segments of society and engaging them in tactics that they can participate in. I remember one of my favorite examples from the Serbian case, the, from the youth-led movement that helped mobilize the population to challenge electoral fraud and stolen elections in the year 2000. So the Otpor youth movement, were, these, got, these men and women were very good strategists. And their first target group for recruitment was the elderly. Why? Because the elderly in Serbian society had lots of time on their hands. They could distribute leaflets, flyers, talk to people, hang out at places, make phone calls, and they were less suspecting than the young revolutionaries who were leading the movement. So they could do things and get away with doing things that the younger activists um, could not. And so it was sort of a brilliant case. This was the first group that they recruited. That was in the thinking. How do we bring this um, constituency on board? And the pensioners were suffering under the economic policies in Serbia. So they had an incentive to participate in hopes of changing the system because they weren't faring very well. So it just, beyond the social media, there's a role for it. It's more the online, offline strategizing and moving from just mobilization and protests and rallies to organization, which at the end of the day is going to help you sustain a movement and bring in sort of the diverse sectors that you need to succeed. Not to diminish the, the value or the importance of, of social media networks, but we've, we've also seen around the world other social networks be incredibly useful for exchanging information and organizing people, religious networks, for example. And this is something we saw in Egypt, 
one of the largest days of protest in Cairo was the day that the internet was shut off. Hmm. And people refer to Egypt maybe as the Facebook revolution, these sorts of things. Yes, Facebook was very useful. But when the internet was shut off, activists went into the mosques and organized through the mosques. And that, gen that network led to one of the largest protests in the, in the, throughout the Egyptian revolution. So I think it's, there, are, there are other social networks beyond those that require one of these that are valuable and not necessarily always made the most use of by, by activists. On the other hand, many local activists would immediately say, no, 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 here is a local network that we need to engage, engage with Katchus in Yemen, for example, or, or, or just one more example. Um, just to take a page out of what you said, I mean, the question I ask is, what if, what if on that day, those activists had gone into the mosques and filmed themselves doing what they did and then put it on Facebook. There's always, there, not always, there's often a way of amplifying and, and expanding your message. Um, and one of the things we talk about in this, this movie is what to do when the media still won't cover you. And we talk about how to cover yourselves, which is another whole discipline, a set of skills that come in very handy. My name is Nadia. I'm, I was an activist uh, for prisoners of conscience in Jordan. Actually, I just wanted to point out, Scott, you just answered actually part of my uh, inquiry. Uh, we're talking, when we talk about Egypt and Jordan, they are deep states. The intelligence, they play Muhabarat. I mean, I used to organize um, protests for um, the mothers of uh, prisoners of conscience or uh, tortured prisoners, whatever. And the Mukhabarat used to threaten them. Uh, they used to threaten them, they will fire the husbands from their work and stuff. And they wouldn't, it was such um, a hard effort for me to get them to, or they would tell them tomorrow they'll be released or something. Don't go, if you go, you're gonna. So the Mukhabarat works against that so much. And even the media guys, like you have to depend on independent uh, media for coverage because the, the main channels uh, there for the government, uh, they, they threaten them. And when they come, like one guy uh, took a picture of uh, one of the Baltajia uh, breaking my car and they broke his camera, you know? So you have to deal with these things. It's different. Um, so there are other ways where you can, uh, with the, your mobile, as you mentioned in the movie also, that you can take your own pictures and stuff uh, like that. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Nadia. Um, maybe behind, yeah. Um, I'm Maria Fernanda from Colombia, and my question is referring, will refer to negotiations more broadly. So thinking of the case in Colombia that there's a very visible peace negotiation going on. And we usually think of two parties, but we understand that it's more complicated than that, that are negotiations within the parties. But my question refers also to society in general. Uh, and what do you think would be key elements to bridge or to create bridges with society beyond the usual ones? So this is a negoci negotiation that's trying to bring in to society and victims very actively, but then what we will think of the passive uh, part of society, like the spectators, that maybe will be engaged through media, but there's a lot of misinformation. And my question refers to how to like, create those bridges to try to accomplish what you were saying of changing minds or uh, understanding the different sides of the story and like enhancing people's thinking. Um, also thinking about long-term healing. That's it. <laughs> I guess the, the counterpart to civil resistance is elite engagement with the public. And that can happen in a number of ways. In a place like Colombia, you now have the population saying, why should people from the FARC or the paramilitaries benefit from an amnesty or from any kind of process that confers real or imagined impunity. 
And the moment of peace is now being sort of hijacked with, wait a minute, somebody has to pay for what we all have suffered for what are really several wars over several decades with multiple uh, belligerents. What can a government do about that? Well, governments and, and insurgents have to do some sort of public engagement, some sort of media campaign. I think it's got to be more than press conferences and press releases. There, there, there cannot be a reversal of, of uh, massive demonization of the enemy with a press release. If, if you've been mobilizing your population to hate FARC, for example, for as long as they've existed, uh, they're not going to love them the day the peace agreement is announced, right? That, that is just foolish thinking. So there has to be a combination of public appearances together, of symbolic actions together, of some engagement with the public in the sense of possible local dialogues, town halls, ways for people to express their frustrations and concerns and to channel them and to hear somebody respond to them. That's costly and it's time consuming, but it can be done. I think we're seeing success uh, in, in these sorts of things in Tunisia. Um, I've seen and participated in small, temporarily successful efforts like that in Haiti. Um, so there are ways to, to spread out a new message and counter the old message. And, and I think that's part of the answer to your, to your query. Just a tidbit. So the other, these dialogue based and the public appearances, these will all appeal to the rational and, um, you know, the um, sort of dialogical approaches to bridging divides and engaging the other. There's also a powerful role for the arts. And I'm mentioning this, um, Columbia, you have so many amazing artists and performers. And in terms of what promotes reconciliation often in places in divided societies, engaging the musicians, uh, the dramatists in a peace building process, it's underappreciated. It's incredibly powerful because it moves the emotions, it moves the soul, it allows you to reimagine the other and imagine coexistence in a way that these normal processes that we study and we talk about simply don't. Just as a little example, we had the Afro-Colombian group Explosio Negra come to USIP, uh, what, almost a year ago now. Mm -hmm. They performed at USIP, and it was all about how their music was trying to bridge divides in society and bring minority groups and majority groups together as part of the peace process. So don't underestimate the power of the arts in doing this. Be quick. Um, so in, in addition to the arts, also sport. Um, we, anyone who's seen the movie Endgame and heard the story of Nelson Mandela putting on a Springboks jersey once he became president was incredibly symbolic. It was, it was one moment, um, and he had a, a long history of, as, as I discussed, sort of reaching across the, the enemy line. But that image has been replayed and reshown and meant a great deal to people who, as Maria suggested, may be making emotional decisions as opposed to sort of more, more rational ones. Thank you. Um, well, good afternoon to the panel and thank you so much for your insight. It's really um, engaging this conversation. So I know that uh, at this point we're a little past mediation because I was mentioned at the beginning, but Dr. Wanis, I think you mentioned it during your presentation. And I was wondering if some struggling movements lack disability or they don't draw enough attention to get third party actors, external third party actors, um, to be engaged in the conflict. So when the committed agent refrains from employing violence against the regime or the government, and this of course places this in a disadvantage um, in the conflict, and there is more difficulties in reaching that mutually hurting stalemate that could enable mediation, um, what happens? Or, or is it possible really to find um, hope in mediation for an early exit from the conflict to sustainable and credible negotiations? And how can struggling movements bring these external actors when the movement may in itself not have enough force yet? Could you tell us your name? Oh, thank you. Um, Emmanuel. I am uh, a recent graduate from Venezuela and a former grantee of the State Department. Great. Thank, thank you. you. 
and has been at USIP courses here in the building in the past, mm. including the mediation one. Uh, how can mediation help? Well, I, in a part of my career, I, I worked as a mediator between labor unions and management around the United States, mostly teachers unions and school boards, who had about the same amount of rancor as the PLO and the Israelis. Uh, when it came to contract renegotiation time. And uh, a media mediator can certainly play a role, subject to all the usual caveats. Do the parties accept the mediator? Uh, will they work in good faith with the mediator? Will they empower us to negotiate on their behalf with their counterparts uh, when they will not speak to each other directly? Or can we empower them to rebuild the bridges of communication that they have abandoned or neglected? So a third party can play an interesting role. Certainly, uh, I think that, that uh, King in Birmingham was using the business community not as a mediator, but as an intermediary. They were, in a sense, a third party between the population and the civil resistance activities and government. Why? Because they could exert direct influence and leverage on government. And in a sense, they were using the federal government to put pressure on local authorities. So instead of speaking about mediation per se, we could talk about intermediation. How do you use other parties to speak on your behalf? And there are many, many examples of that process all over civil resistance uh, cases. And I'm just beginning to scratch the surface of them, but you know, there's, there's one interesting example. To add to that, People like King had people that were focused on negotiation. People like Andrew Young were their go-to negotiators. Who is he going to send to speak to the governor or to the mayor or to the city council folks or to the business community? Designated teams of people whose purpose and task was to persuade the other side to do something. Uh, they were also, in a sense, intermediaries. Intermediaries between the mass popular uprising and authorities, right? So although they were not technically mediators, they were playing an intermediary role with some of the, some of the valuable advantages that those confer on a process. You may need to take them all together, and then we'll wrap. Yes. There are many, but uh, so let's see. Uh, how many more questions? So there's one in the back. Anyone else here? If not, I, I'll two, and then Darren, maybe you have one. So. Go ahead. We'll take all three, and then we'll um, wrap up. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for a great, great conversation. I'm uh, Orion Donovan Smith. I recently spent a year working in Burundi. Um, and Liz, I'm very happy you brought up the point about the sort of digital divide, um, particularly social media in that context. I think it's important to note that you know, that's going to be different in Egypt uh, and in Ukraine and, and in each one of these cases. But certainly in Burundi, that's a very important factor. Uh, and it leads to a, a broader point I'd like to raise. And I'll do my best to turn this into an actual question for you guys. Um, in a lot of these earlier cases we point to, I think India, South Africa, um, and others, you had a fairly, what might be a little easier um, situation to work with, you had a, a majority, a, a movement that represented really a majority in a society. Um, now you have a lot of these cases like Burundi where you have these very decidedly illiberal democracies, but uh, areas where you have uh, a protest movement um, that may not necessarily represent the majority of the population, but nevertheless has, has legitimate grievances. And then as the movement goes on, the repression of that movement itself is, becomes another grievance that's, of course, very hard to, to resolve. Um, I guess my question then is, is how can, uh, and particularly I, I should say in the case of Burundi, you have, a, a, you know, it's the least urbanized country in the world, I think outside some, some Pacific islands, maybe. Um, so you have a you know, relatively small uh, urban population um, where the opposition has been based. Uh, there's certainly other, you know, it's, it's a little hard to say exactly uh, who all is for or against the president. but. The demand of the opposition has been, has been absolute. Has been that the president not be there. Um, now, my question then is, is how can you deal with cases where they have legitimate grievances that need to be addressed, but maybe uh, that's not, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to resolve 
uh, something as as absolute as getting rid of the president or not, um, particularly when you know the messaging of the opposition uh, may not be great. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Keep it short. Okay, yeah. Um, my name's Kayleen Gordy. I'm an intern at the International Center of Nonviolent Conflict. Um, mine is back on the topic of negotiation. And as um, we, third party observers and researchers, can see that negotiation is not a surrender for activists and um, movements, how do we um, shed light on that to the activists themselves um, so that they are more willing to participate in such negotiation? This question comes from Althea in our online forum. Um, she writes, hi, everyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, her question's for the panel. In the USIP Civil Resistance course, we talk about the six steps of Kingian nonviolence, which were born out of studying nonviolent movements, in particular, the civil rights movements in the US. In Kingian nonviolence negotiations come before direct action because Dr. King believes, quote, all other options should be exhausted before resorting to direct action. But as someone who came into this field through a strategic nonviolent conflict perspective, I was never fully satisfied with that explanation. I'm most interested to learn about what the empirical evidence says about the relationship between negotiations and nonviolent action, broadly, not just direct action, in terms of which comes first. Is there a generalizable trend, or is it more of an iterative process, as much of the civil resistance case studies might suggest? Great, thank you. Uh, Maria? So we're going to wrap up and just uh, we'll go down the line. How about we do that? Great so idea. those were all um, uh, really good, uh, really good questions. To start with the last one, um, there isn't specific empirical data that's been collected to my knowledge. So the one that who would be collecting this is Erica Chenoweth at, at Denver. And but I think um, it is possible to collect data on the role of negotiations in nonviolent movements. So that is definitely one way to get at because it's con it's going to be very context specific. It's going to be dependent on the phase of the conflict where where it's at, and it's going to be a question of sequencing interaction. So it, there's I don't it's hard to imagine a, a clear cut. Um, universal principle of what that sequencing looks like, but that's something that data uh, certainly can be collected on. So I'll leave it with that. I'll go out on a little bit of a limb. I would suspect that often negotiations um, are, are a first step, and when they are rebuffed, rejected, or are conducted in bad faith by one or more of the parties, then people start looking for more coercive means. And among the course of means that would include massive civil resistance because it is a way of resetting the power imbalances in society and changing people's minds. So I'd, I'd imagine that negotiation is often a starting point uh, and it is often unsuccessful, leads to other things and then you get back to negotiations at many points. You have to include negotiations in the empowerment of, of activists. Um, in my experience, they don't like the thought of negotiations. So you have to persuade them that it is part of empowering them to affect change, and that people don't just change because you tell them to, which is itself a coercive assumption. And it's integrating negotiations in nonviolent action training, like making that an explicit part of civil resistance training, which is possible. Um, just to, to add to that point, we every member of a civil resistance movement doesn't have to become a negotiator. Right? And one of the reasons I say that is because when we have successful movements, like the ANC in South Africa or in, in Georgia, for example, you have huge blocks of activists, of civil society, who move over the course of a day into government. And in those two instances, left a bit of a vacuum behind. Mm. And so when we think about the need to implement an agreement, the need to ensure Open, openness for civil society and for democratic governance, someone needs to be left behind in civil society, in the streets, holding the new government to account, holding both sides to account. So not everyone has to negotiate. Some people can stay and, and be activists and still play a produ productive role in society afterwards. Very quickly to your question about Burundi, I don't know, don't know the 
the, the case all that well, but I can tell you that um, generally speaking, there, there, there can be a timeline when, when demands are seen as unrealistic or impossible, never going to happen kind of thing. Um, activists need to think about the rate and order at which they're unfurling their demands and their agenda. Um, and if, if, if um, the initial set of demands are moderate um, and become more and more specific and strident with time, you can find a situation where media, will, media exposure grants a kind of critical mass. It's dangerous to do this, and, and it often is dangerous to do this, but it's dangerous to do this until you're, you reach a certain level of recognition. Once you've reached that level of recognition, it becomes less. Just one last thing, I think, on Ryan's question. Uh, it, it actually goes very much to the first comment, which was about implementation. And I think that was one of the big failures in Burundi, although I worked there for a very long time on implementation. But nonetheless, I uh, uh, will incriminate myself, I guess, in that regard. I, I think understanding how some of the changes were going to play themselves out and sustaining and this goes to the role of the international community and, and, and third parties as well, but how were we going to help civil society and government sustain the changes that they'd undertaken such that it would not lead to today? And I, I think some people a, were not left behind, if you will, to help that implementation process and to sustain a certain amount of pressure on the government to implement things. I think in terms of the digital divide, while it exists, that goes then to the question of, well, what are the more traditional means of civil resistance? And Burundi's always been plagued, I think, like other countries, where the activists in civil, in civil society tended to locate them or tend to locate themselves in the capital city and forget about all of those other people in the interior of the country. And so having a different strategy, a communication strategy, who are we trying to reach, who are we trying to convince, and not just the government, but really who is out there who could then join our effort. And that part of the negotiation process never really happened, I think. Um, so that's one reason why the movement could not be sustained in Burundi. So just a couple of final comments. Do you want to wrap up? Yeah. So to wrap, um, first I want to thank our panelists for really engaging, insightful uh, presentations. Um, so thank you all very much. Thanks to our global campus audience who um, offered really, ins really great and um, personal questions and comments to the conversation. Thank you all for coming out. Um, and thank you to the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy for co-sponsoring uh, this morning's event. So this is obviously a conversation that we will be continuing here at the United States Institute of Peace on this uh, intersection of civil resistance and peace building. So we welcome you to join future events. Have a great day. And thanks to you, Maria Stefan.